Assalamu alaikum. Hope you're all doing well. Today, my video lecture is on the very important muscle of the human body, the giant muscle, which is known as the diaphragm. We're all familiar with hiccups. We all get the hiccups. Well, the muscle responsible for that is the diaphragm. And today, this is what we're going to be discussing. That is the gross anatomy of this muscle. So our learning objectives for today's session are that at the end, you should be able to describe the location, attachments, innervation, and blood supply of the diaphragm. Also, you should be able to identify the openings in the diaphragm and the structures that pass through these openings. Also, you should be able to enumerate and explain the functions of the diaphragm and then correlate the functional anatomy with congenital and acquired hernias. So what is the diaphragm? How do we define the diaphragm? What's the meaning of the word diaphragm? This has been derived from a Greek word and literally the word dia means through and phram means fence. So the word diaphragm means through the fence. Now, why do uh, we call this muscle the diaphragm? This will be elaborated. The basic concept that you have to keep in mind about this muscle is that it is a curved muscular fibrous sheet that separates the thoracic from the abdominal cavities. So it is the separation point, the muscle that is separating thoracic cavity above from abdominal cavity below. And it is pierced by those structures which are going to pass between these two regions of the human body. And this is why it is called diaphragm, meaning through the fence. It is also the primary muscle of respiration. And regarding the shape, it is dome-shaped. And by dome shape, we mean it is rounded in two parts. And these two parts, which are the domes, are the peripheral part of the muscle, whereas the central uniting portion is called the central tendinous part of the diaphragm. So here is a very simple diagram in front of you. And if you could follow my laser pointer, I'll be guiding you to this structure of the diaphragm. And you can see that it has these muscular this is the right dome, and here is the muscular left dome of the diaphragm. These domes are also called the cupulae of the diaphragm. The portion in the middle is known as the central tendon, and this central tendon supports the pericardium, which is surrounding the heart. So here is the central portion, the central tendon, and these are the domes which are present in the peripheral part. Now, normally, what is the level or location of the domes? The right dome, remember, reaches as high as the upper border of the fifth rib, whereas the left dome may reach the lower border of the fifth rib. Now, why does the right dome have a higher level? That is because it is present just above the large-sized liver. Here is a simple diagram showing us the right dome, which is present at the upper border of the fifth rib. You know we count ribs from the second costal cartilage marked at the sternal angle of Louis. So moving from the second costal cartilage downwards, you can see this would be the third and the fourth and then the fifth rib, which has been cut away in this diagram to show us that the right dome of the diaphragm is reaching this here fifth rib, whereas at its lower border lies the upper margin of the left dome of the diaphragm. These are the crurae of the diaphragm. We will be talking about them in the next few slides. Now, remember that the level of the diaphragm, which I just described to you, is not a constant level. It is affected by many factors. The first most important factor is, of course, the phase of respiration. As I mentioned before, the diaphragm is the muscle responsible for respiration. When the diaphragm contracts, the domes of the diaphragm, they are going to move downwards. During quiet inspiration, uh, the domes only move downwards. And in the maximal inspiration, that is the deep inspiration, the central tendon of the diaphragm is also moved or pulled downwards. This increases the vertical diameter of the thoracic cavity. Now, the right dome of the diaphragm, when it moves downwards, in case of maximum or deep inspiration, it can move downwards to the level of the sixth rib. And this is a distance of about 10 centimeters. And during forced expiration, the right dome moves back upwards and it can reach the fourth costal cartilage, which is approximately at the level of the right nipple. The position of the left dome of the diaphragm is always 
one rib lower in comparison to the right toe. The posture also has an effect on the level of the diaphragm. So we know that if a person is sitting or standing, then the diaphragm will be at a lower level in comparison to when the person is lying down, that is in supine position, when the level of the diaphragm becomes higher. Also, the abdominal viscera have an influence on the level of the diaphragm. Immediately after a large meal, when the stomach is distended, this will cause the position or level of the diaphragm to shift higher. Similarly, the posture, uh, other than the posture, also the build of the individual has an effect on the level of the diaphragm. So a person who is a short or heavyweight, their diaphragm will be at a higher level in comparison to the tall, thin individuals, in which case the diaphragm will be at a lower level. Also, there are certain other factors which affect the level of the diaphragm, like suppose a lung disease in which there is overinflation of the lungs, such as emphysema, this will cause the level of the diaphragm to move lower. Now let's come to the basic attachments of the diaphragm when we talk about the origin of the diaphragm. Remember, it is in three parts. First is the sternal point of origin. This is from the posterior surface of the ziphy sternum in the form of two fleshy slips. And this is the uh, highest point of origin and it might not always be present. Then the costal origin of the diaphragm is from the deep surfaces of the lower six ribs and their costal cartilages. And this is the one which forms the right and left domes of the diaphragm. Here you can see a simple diagram in profile. We can see this is the sternum and behind the sternum is the heart and the aorta, the descending aorta. And here is the vertebral column. So if you follow my laser pointer, I'm now going to trace the diaphragm. This line over here, if you follow my laser pointer, is representing the diaphragm, which looks like an inverted J from the side. You can see that the anterior attachment of the diaphragm is to the posterior surface of the ziphy sternum. And here is the central tendon or central portion of diaphragm on which rests the heart enclosed by fibrous pericardium. And this is the more peripheral part of diaphragm, which is the curved muscular part. The third point of origin of diaphragm is from the vertebrae. And to be more specific, it is the lumbar vertebrae. And this origin is in the form of vertical columns or pillars, also known as crura. And this part also has its origin from the arcuate ligaments. Now, first, let's talk about the crura. What are the crura? There is a right crust and there is a right left crust. The right crust arises from the sides of the bodies of the first three lumbar vertebrae and intervertebral discs. Whereas the left crust of origin of the diaphragm is from the sides of the bodies of first two lumbar vertebrae and intervertebral discs. So keep in mind the right crust, it is longer and it is more thicker in comparison to the left one. The origin of diaphragm is also from arcuate ligaments. Now the arcuate ligaments, these are aponeurotic arches, also known as the lumbocostal arches. They lie lateral to the crura on both sides. These are the medial arcuate ligament, which is simply the thick and upper margin of the fascia that is covering the source muscle. And then the lateral arcuate ligament, which is the thick and upper margin of the fascia covering the quadratus lumborum muscle. Okay, so here we have this diagram from Regional Anatomy by Snell. And in this very simple diagram, we can see the attachments of the diaphragm as seen from below. Now, if you follow my laser pointer over here, you can see that these are the crural attachments of the diaphragm. So here is the right crust of the diaphragm. Its origin is from the first three lumbar vertebrae. And then is the left crust of the diaphragm. Its origin is from the first two lumbar vertebrae. And you can see that over here, this upper margin of the sous fascia, this is having the medial arcuate ligament. The attachment of the medial arcuate ligament is from the side of the body of second lumbar vertebra to the tip of the transverse process of the first lumbar vertebra. Then comes the lateral arcuate ligament. This is the lateral arcuate ligament. Its point of attachment is from the tip of transverse process of first lumbar vertebra to the lower border of the 12th rib. 
So these are the medial and lateral awkward ligaments. And you can see on both sides, we have these medial and lateral awkward ligaments. And the medial, you can see portions of the crura are also connected by another ligament in the midline, which is known as the median arcuate ligament. Now, the median arcuate ligament is poorly defined. It is not always present. But when it is present, it is going to be on the anterior surface of the aorta. And you can see that it is at the level of the thoracolumbar intervertebral disc. Let's also look over here at this right crust. The right crust, medially, some of its fibers they form a sling-like loop around the esophagus at its point of entry into the diaphragm. This is known as the esophageal opening within the diaphragm. The portion above it you can see shaded in light green represents the central tendon, which is a thin but strong aponeurosis of interwoven fibers. And it possesses an opening through which there is passage of the inferior vena cava. Okay, so what about the insertion of the diaphragm? So the insertion, like I just mentioned, is actually the central tendon. And the central tendon is in the shape of three leaves. These leaves are also known as folia. So this is a trifoliate representation. And on the superior aspect, the surface of the tendon, remember, is partially fused with the fibrous pericardium. Now let's briefly look at the relations of the diaphragm. What are its relations? What are the structures surrounding it? Superior to it is the pleura, the pericardium, and below it is the peritoneum. Now on the right side, you can see the large uh, right dome of the diaphragm. It is molded over the convex surface of the right lobe of the liver, right kidney, and right suprarenal gland. Whereas on the left side, the left dome confirms to the left lobe of the liver, fundus of stomach, spleen, left kidney and left suprarenal gland. Okay, so now the basic aspects that I've discussed regarding the origin, insertion, I'm going to represent them and talk about them on a three-dimensional model, which is going to help us understand this in a much better way. Okay. So as you know, we talked about the two domes of the diaphragm. And when we're talking about these two domes of uh, the diaphragm, we should keep in mind that the right dome of the diaphragm, it is larger and it is much more massive in comparison to the left dome. So here you can see in front of you, this is the model, the digital model of the diaphragm. And you can appreciate that over here we have, if you just follow the pointer, the larger, light, uh, the larger right dome of the diaphragm. So if I look at it from below and move it around, you can appreciate that this is the larger dome. And over here is the left dome of the diaphragm. So you can see the curved appearance, the curved structure of these domes. And beneath this right dome, like I mentioned, will be the large right lobe of the liver. And beneath the left dome will be the left lobe of the liver. Also, let's look at the crura. So here is the right crust. And you can see the right crust, it is larger, more prominent in comparison to the left crust over here. Also, let's look at the location of the awkward ligaments. So lateral to the Crus is the medial arcuate ligament and then comes the lateral arcuate ligament. Also, if we look at the openings within the diaphragm, we can see that in the midline between the two crura, this is the location of the aorta. To be more correct, technically speaking, the aorta passes behind the diaphragm. So this opening is more of a musculo aponeurotic opening. And here the aorta passes. And if we look at a level which is above that, we can see that the right crust of the diaphragm, its medial most fibers are forming a sling-like loop around this opening, which is known as the esophageal opening of the diaphragm as it transmits the esophagus.
along with the vagus nerves and other structures which we'll be talking about in the next slides. And then here is this prominent opening. This is within the central tendon and this is the opening of the inferior vena cava. So this is the caval opening through which the inferior vena cava passes and it might be accompanied by the right phrenic nerve or the right phrenic nerve might pass through a separate opening in the central tendon, which you can see over here. Also, if we look at the domes from below, we can see an opening in the left dome of the diaphragm. This is for the left phrenic nerve. So these openings, which are the large openings of the diaphragm, the aortic, esophageal, and caval openings, these are at the th level of thoracic vertebrae T12, T10, and T8, respectively. Okay, so now that we have understood the uh, essential features of the diaphragm on the model, we can go back to our presentation. We were talking about the diaphragm and now we are going to be discussing the apertures a little in detail. So diaphragm can be simply said to be a gateway between the thorax and the abdomen. Yes, it is a gateway because it is transmitting a number of structures and we know that there are three large openings and several smaller ones. The major openings I just showed you in the model from below upwards, these are the aortic opening, then the esophageal opening, and then the caval opening. And a simple mnemonic, if we look at the first letters, A, E, C, from below upwards will represent the three openings, the three major openings of the diaphragm. The aortic opening transmits not only the aorta, but it also transmits the uh, thoracic duct as well. It is the lowest and most posterior of the openings. And I said it's an osseoaponeurotic opening. Why? Because it is actually present behind the diaphragm and it is transmitting a zygous vein. It is also transmitting thoracic duct along with the aorta. Then if we look at the uh, other opening, which is the esophageal one, we know it is formed by the sling of muscle fibers derived from the right crust. And along with the esophagus, it transmits the vagus nerves, esophageal branches of left gastric vessels, and the lymphatics from lower one third of the esophagus. The caval opening, which is the highest one, it is at uh, the junction of the right leaf or folium with the area of the central tendon. So this is entirely an aponeurotic opening transmitting inferior vena cava and some branches of right phrenic nerve. So here is a diagram which is showing us these three openings at the thoracic levels, the aortic opening at T12, the esophageal opening at T10, and the caval opening at T8. These are the three openings through this diaphragm. Now, the smaller openings, there are also other structures passing through the diaphragm, such as flattening nerves, which pierce the crura. The hemiozygous vein, it pierces the left crust, and also many minor veins, they pierce the central tendon. Left phrenic nerve also pierces the left dome, as I showed you in the model. Then we have superior epigastric vessels, which pass between the sternal and costal origins of the diaphragm sympathetic trunks which descend behind medial arcuate ligament, subcostal vessels and nerves which pass behind the lateral arcuate ligament, and we also have neuromuscular, neuro, sorry, neurovascular bundles of the 7th to 11th intercostal spaces which pass into the anterior abdominal wall through the costal origin. So looking at this diagram again, we can see behind the medial arcuate ligament, these are the sympathetic trunks on either side which are passing through the diaphragm. Also, just behind the lateral arcuate ligament, you can see the subcostal nerve emerging and passing through. And here is the left phrenic nerve, which is piercing the left dome of the diaphragm. Now, let's talk about the nerve supply of the diaphragm itself. We know the diaphragm is supplied by the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve is a mixed nerve. It has both motor and sensory fibers. Regarding the motor fibers, remember the phrenic nerve is the sole motor supplier to the diaphragm and it is derived from the fourth cervical ramus with contributions from third and fifth. The sensory fibers are going to the parietal pleura and peritoneum related to the central part of the diaphragm, whereas the proprioceptive fibers are also present from the musculature of the diaphragm. 
And the peripheral part of the diaphragm, remember the sensory supply is from the lower six intercostal nerves. Here is a diagram from Gray's Anatomy and it simply shows us these here are the paired phrenic nerves and you can see these nerves are passing anteriorly to the pulmonary hyla and they're accompanied by pericardiophrenic vessels. And the right phrenic nerve you can see is first lying lateral to superior vena cava. Then it descends between the mediastinal pleura and fibrous pericardium. And eventually it uh, divides into branches just above or at the level of the diaphragm. And a similar course is followed by the left phrenic nerve. Keep in mind, that the right phrenic nerve passes through the central tendon of the diaphragm, either through the caval opening or just lateral to it. And it eventually gives off three main branches and the knowledge of the location of these branches is necessary to avoid injury uh, to these nerves during surgery. Now that we have discussed the basic anatomy of the diaphragm, related to it, I would like to talk about the applied aspects which you should be familiar with whenever we're considering the diaphragm. We know that the pain of the diaphragm, which could be due to the inflammation of diaphragmatic pleura in different lung diseases like pneumonia, is referred to the tip of the shoulder because of the common nerve root origins. That is the cervical nerve root origins. This is known as the referred pain. The other applied aspect is the phrenic nerve injury, which might occur due to surgeries and uh, commonly it can occur due to heart surgeries and this can cause paralysis of the uh, same side of the diaphragm that is the ipsilateral diaphragm. Phrenic nerve injury of the ipsilateral diaphragm causes uh, respiratory distress and uh, diminished breath sounds on the affected side. Also since the diaphragm is paralyzed it uh, would not be moving and its level would be elevated and this is known as the eventration of the diaphragm. This can be investigated and visualized on a chest radiograph. Also, it causes the paradoxical movements of the diaphragm, which can be investigated through fluoroscopy or ultrasonography. Now, coming to the arterial supply of the diaphragm, just remember that the main central portion of this muscle is supplied by inferior phrenic arteries, which are branches of abdominal aorta whereas the uh, costal margins or the peripheral part of diaphragm is supplied by the intercostal arteries. And then when we talk about venous drainage, remember the right phrenic vein drains into inferior vena cava, whereas the left phrenic vein, which is often double, one branch ends in left renal or suprarenal vein, whereas the other joins also the inferior vena cava. Coming now to the interesting part, which is the actions of the diaphragm, we need to correlate this with the anatomy. So how can we summarize the most important actions of the diaphragm? First of all, we know it is the muscle of inspiration. So what happens is that when this muscle contracts uh, during, like I mentioned before, in quiet uh, inspiration, its domes are going to move downwards. And in deep inspiration, the central tendon is also pulled downwards. This increases the vertical diameter of the thoracic cavity. And this is how this muscle facilitates inspiration. And in quiet respiration, the diaphragm simply relaxes to decrease the vertical diameter of thoracic cavity during exhalation. During inhalation, the intercostal muscles in deep inspiration, they will also contract. And this increases the transverse diameter of thoracic cavity, uh, which is due to the elevation of the lower ribs, also known as the bucket handle movement. Also, the sternum, it moves anteriorly in a forwards direction during inspiration, which is known as the pump handle movement, which increases the anteroposterior diameter of the thoracic cap. These are the basic movements which are related to the anatomy of breathing. Other than inspiration, the diaphragm is also known as a muscle of abdominal straining. Now, before this, what is abdominal straining? Let me talk about this. Abdominal straining is when there is an increase in the intra-abdominal pressure which facilitates the evacuation of abdominal pelvic contents. During activities such as micturition or defecation or childbirth, that is parturition. So do you know the abdominal obliques, uh, the rectus abdominis and transversus abdominis? These muscles are going to contract and they're very strong muscles which increase intra-abdominal pressure. The diaphragm also contracts 
And the help offered by the diaphragm is that as this muscle contracts, we know that it is going to uh, move downwards. And this will, of course, increase the intra-abdominal pressure. But at the same time, what's going to happen is that the di diaphragm is going to be fixed. Now, this fixation occurs because the glottis will be closed and this will trap air within the uh, thoracic cavity. So this trapped air acts like you could say a cushion of compressed air or a balloon of compressed air, which is now exerting its force on the intra-abdominal contents. So this helps in abdominal straining. For similar reasons, this diaphragm uh, is also having a role during heavy weight lifting because during heavy weight lifting, the diaphragm is also going to be uh, fixed and that trapped air is now going to uh, facilitate weight lifting because uh, the spine will not be flexed and the post vertebral muscles such as erector spinae can act on the vertebral column for heavy weight lifting. Also, the diaphragm acts as a thoracoabdominal pump. Well, this is simply because as the intra abdominal pressure increases, uh, the uh, pressure within the thoracic cavity decreases. So this difference in the pressure actually increases uh, the venous return to the heart via the inferior vena cava. Also remember during the contraction of the diaphragm, the caval opening, it becomes relaxed or enlarged, which then facilitates the return of blood through the inferior vena cava to the heart. Whereas the esophageal opening is closed or compressed, so the abdominal contents, the stomach contents are not regurgitated into the esophagus. Now hiccup, as I mentioned before, the diaphragm is the muscle responsible for the hiccup, which is often produced after eating a sudden large meal. So what happens is that after a large meal, there is distension of, and there's, uh, when there's a rapid distension of the stomach, this causes the irritation of the vagus nerves which in turn causes an involuntary spasmodic contraction of the diaphragm muscle. And this is also accompanied by a closure of the glottis, there's approximation of the vocal cords, and that produces the characteristic uh, hick sound due to the release of the trapped air. And this is the hiccup. Okay, so in the end, when we are discussing the um, um, the applied aspect of the diaphragm, we have to talk about hernias. Now, hernia, you know, is when there is going to be some abnormal opening within the diaphragm, and this can cause the movement of the abdominal contents through the diaphragm. And this can be congenital or it can be acquired. First, let's talk about congenital diaphragmatic hernias. What you need to know is that the most common type of congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which is present at birth, it can be an, uh, which is due to the abnormality in the embryological processes, is the one which is known as the hernia of Bokhtalek. This hernia occurs in the posterolateral part of the diaphragm, usually in, on the left side. And this is due to the absence of the pleuroperitoneal membrane on the left side. And the prognosis depends upon the degree of pulmonary hypoplasia. We will be talking about that when we see the diagram in the next slide. The other type of hernia with congenital hernia is the subcostal sternal hernia. This is also known as the hernia of Morgani, but this is a less common type of hernia. And it is usually asymptomatic. Here is our diagram and we can see over here if you follow the pointer, this blue area is showing the location of the Bokhtalex hernia. This hernia, as you can see, is present in the posterior portion of the diaphragm. Anteriorly is the hernia of Morgani, which is present between the sternal and costal slips of origin of the diaphragm, but this is the less common one. Also, less commonly, the central tendon might have a the, her uh, the herniation due to a defect in central tendon or in the region of the esophagus, which is known as the hiatus hernia. But hiatal hernias are usually acquired and not congenital. So if we look at congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which is in the posterolateral part, we can see that this here is showing us the movement of the abdominal contents, the bowel, the liver. They have entered the thoracic cavity through this defect, 
in the diaphragm. So this is the herniation which has occurred through the defect. And of course, it is going to assert or have the pressure effects on the lung. So the lung will be affected. There will be pulmonary hypoplasia. And this determines the prognosis or how it's going to be carried on. Now, hiatus hernia is the one which is related to the esophageal opening. And these, like I said, are developed later in life and they're acquired. And they're of essentially two types. Type one is the sliding hiatal hernia and type two is the rolling hiatal hernia. So here is a simple diagram. On the left, you can see the normal stomach and location of the gastroesophageal junction at the level of the diaphragm. Now, in case of the sliding hiatal hernia, you can see that the esophageal gastric junction has moved upwards into the thoracic cavity beyond the diaphragm. And this is known as, therefore, the sliding hiatal hernia. Then comes the parasophageal in which the original gastroesophageal junction is at the same location as it normally would be, but it is accompanied by a portion of the stomach which has entered into the thoracic cavity. This is the herniated portion of the stomach, and so it is known as parasophageal since it is parallel to esophagus, the parasophageal or rolling type of hernia. Now, these hernias are acquired hernias, which means they usually occur later in life after 40s or 50s. And uh, they are usually associated with the gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, so this concludes with uh, today's topic, which was uh, on the diaphragm, which was on the gross anatomy of the diaphragm. We discussed the basic a concept of the diaphragm, the origin, the insertion, the nerve supply, the blood supply. And also we talked about uh, the relations of the diaphragm. And uh, in the end, uh, the apertures, the openings, which are very important. Remember, this is an important topic. It's a commonly asked question. It often appears in the exam. So please uh, look at it and study it in detail. And uh, thank you for listening to this video lecture. And if you liked my uh, lecture, then kindly uh, like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is Anatomy Mentor. And also you can do that by simply clicking on my picture at the end of this video lecture. Okay, so thank you.